Hello, all neuroplasticians. Hope you're well. I'm very excited to be here with Professor Michael Platt. Hope you're well today, Michael. How is Pennsylvania? Well, it's a beautiful day today. Cold, but uh, just a fantastic day in November. Great very to be good. here. Well, no, it's really great to have you join us. It's really exciting to have you join our advisory board. It's very exciting to have you in our community. You, your reputation precedes you in a good way. Your book is great. <laughs> Cogware, the technology is great. The the feedback from the students that I know have been through the 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 content are all loving it. So I don't know. Just give us a quick story. Maybe it's a maybe it's a history, or maybe it's an update, or what you've been up to at the moment, or what brought you here. I don't know. What's the right question, Michael? <laughs> There's a lot of territory to cover, but I mean, you know, where I am right now, which is a is a really, I mean, I'm really grateful to the opportunities that I've had, and um, you know, I have just this awesome job at the University of Pennsylvania because I have these three different professorships. So I'm a mm. professor in the School of Medicine, the Department of Neuroscience. I do basic neuroscience. I try to figure out how the brain works, how it falls apart, develop new technologies for advanced diagnostics and therapeutics. So that's one bucket. The second uh, appointment is in the Department of Psychology in the School of Arts and Sciences. So I teach psychology classes and specifically a class on um, being human. So the biology of human culture, which is super fun for me. And then, of course, I'm uh, in the Wharton School of Business where I'm a professor of marketing and founding director of the Wharton Neuroscience Initiative. So the idea behind these kinds of professorships is that I can bridge different disciplines and take insights and technology, say, from medicine, but try to make those relevant and applicable for um, business. And so our, you know, our mantra at uh, Wharton Neuroscience is uh, using applied neuroscience to make business more efficient, more effective, and more humane. And I think that last part is a critical, you know, part of the two former parts. So if we we make it efficient without being humane, um, then uh, that's not a good thing. That's not an advance in my view. There's so much content to get through. I'm going to have to hold me back. I've got so much <laughs> to ask you. I think that we're speaking to a community of neuroplasticians. So they're all interested in the application of neuroplasticity and how that works in business, how that works in their coaching practice, how that works in doing education or consulting. So... I don't know. You're in the medical school as well, so you're seeing neuroplasticity mm -hmm. at a at, at a genetic level, I'm sure. So um, I don't know. Tell us about the work that you're doing in the medical and in psychology, I um, mean, and marketing. But I'm really interested to hear about what you're doing with your technology and your startups. I don't know. Just give give us yeah, give a, us the, give us the truth, the whole truth. <laughs> so so you know in terms of kind of to expand upon what i was saying before especially in the medical side we use a, mm. a range of technologies that go from looking at uh molecules so the genes that are expressed and turned into proteins in single cells in the brain uh connecting that to what the changes in the anatomy and receptor expression of individual cells and then that changes how circuits function which changes overall how your brain functions. And a big question there is exactly what you got at, which is neuroplasticity. So how does kind of the your genetic and genetic endowment you're born with that you get from your parents, which sets up the initial wiring of your brain, and how does it respond and change to the environment, to the activities you engage in, the things that you practice most, to the mm -hmm. challenges in your environment, and in particular to with something I'm super interested in is... Um, your social context. So how, do, mm. how does like making more friends, for example, change the anatomy of your brain and the function of your brain? That's something that we've studied uh, a lot. Um, you know, along the road, uh, what we've done is, is we've discovered that, you know, sometimes the technologies that are available aren't up to the job. And so we, you know, so we've been developing, you know, even, even, you know, stuff that, is not ready for prime time in humans yet, but um, but is is get, you know we're doing advanced uh, development in like light based therapies to change uh, brain function, which can be uh, exquisitely precise and uh, could could be really game changing for you know for diseases like um, epilepsy and seizure disorders. Just just one really basic one. But super exciting for me, and it, it ties the the medicine to Wharton to business is um, development of our neuro, uh, basically 
wearable, high high fidelity wearable brain sensing um, technology. So uh, one of my goals when I, I got to Penn and Wharton was to say, you know, how can we take neuroscience out of the lab, out of the clinic, make it useful to people in the real world, whether that's at home, at business, you know, on the sports field, you name it. And um, we discovered there really wasn't any technology that was simultaneously give you clinical grade insights, but also was really wearable, comfortable, stylish, you know, something you that didn't look like something from science fiction. So, uh, and we discovered that there were a lot of reasons why there wasn't anything like that, because achieving that in terms of sensory technology was hard. Well, we cracked the code on that. And once we did that, we realized, wow, we have some serious intellectual property here. And, you know, to make this really available for widespread use, we need to commercialize it. So we did thin a uh, startup company out of Penn called Cogware Technologies. Encourage you to check out the website. Um, oh, cool. and, the Cogware website is, sorry, I'm interrupting you quickly, but cogwaretech.com yeah. is the right name just for just for yeah. question. So what is it measuring? Is it measuring EEG or what are the, it's me- what are the it, brain uh, yeah. waves or... Yeah, so it's measuring EEG, uh, so electroencephalogram. So these are brain waves, and these brain waves um, that can be measured at the surface of the scalp or the skin mm-hmm. reflect, and they're super tiny. They're like a thousandth the the size of the electrocardiogram you get measured when you're getting your heart checked out. So very hard to measure accurately without electrical interference and the noise and moving and things like that. But like I said before, we cracked that code until we can get that really, really amazingly clean data, which, uh, look, this is brain data. So it's um, it's giving us moment to moment, millisecond to millisecond insights, say, into how focused you are mm. or how frustrated you are or so, so whether you have attention problems. EE, is it basically an EEG band? Is, it a, is that what it is? It is At a very simple band. level. Yeah. At a very simple level, it's an EEG band, but it's also one that... Um, is different from all the others that are on the market. Yeah, you're obviously, spe- you're obviously capturing specific data. So, you know, yeah, tell us. But I'm obviously, I'm loving all this tech. I'm, 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 I'm a gadget guy at the end of the day as well. So, you know, what what, what does it do for people that in the work environment, that in the home environment? What is the see yeah. your vital, your vi- your brain vitals? What does this do for me? What is the what is so so essentially? We've got two verticals that in in the company one that's um, brain health oriented and that's, you know, clinical grade, it's going to be FDA approved. Um, So we're in that process right now. And the objective there is to give you serious vital signs, the same way you'd have a vital sign, like you're taking your temperature to know whether you might have, uh, you know, COVID or flu or something like it's a basic thing or taking your blood pressure. Right. But we don't have those kinds of things that you could do at home for your brain health. So we already have um, objective, you know, really high quality data in the can showing that we can, for example, identify that someone's on the road on the path to an anxiety disorder, a full-blown generalized anxiety before the symptoms become manifest. We can do similar kinds of things for depression. We're working right now on trying to uh, develop our technology for an in-home uh, kind of rapid on, ongoing assessment for uh, trending dementias and whether somebody might be on the path to Alzheimer's disease mm-hmm. or frontotemporal can, dementia. Can, can you spot can you spot potential seizure activity? We can, and that's uh, a really a, another really important application. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, so many people suffer from epilepsy. It's really prevalent in children, mm-hmm. uh, in really young children, or in people who are asleep, or might, people who might be in a coma. There are no obvious physical manifestations. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's extremely common in disorders like autism. And, uh, you know, I talked to just innumerable parents who are like, boy, if we could have our child wear one of these bands so that they know before a seizure is about to become full blown, they could sit down, for example, exactly, you know, exactly. and in fact, our band is now approved in the, by the EU, uh, just the physical band itself to prevent head injuries in, in people who have seizure disorders because they fall over often mm. and then they hit their head and they make the problem worse. Right. Mm. So, um, so it's a, it's actually a protective um, band that was developed. So the carrier for our sensors uh, was developed for sport, for uh, football and for rugby uh, to protect 
uh, sorry, to protect uh, athletes from concussions and traumatic brain injuries. So there's a real nice synergy there, but that's one vertical is sort mm-hmm. of brain health. And the other vertical is kind of everything else. So if you imagine, oh, if mm-hmm. you can get clinical grade brain signals anywhere, anytime, think about what you could do with that. Well, you can use it in athletics and sports, and we have amazing data there showing we can predict how well you're going to perform in the next minute or over a season or over a career, how many yellow cards somebody's going to get uh, in, you know, in football over the course of a season. Yeah, yeah. And then what you can do then is backtrack and say, okay, well, what, you know, what are these signals that you picked up on actually mean? And so we found that different positions in say in football and soccer um, require different kinds of cognitive and emotional states to have high performance. Mm. And so we can see those falling off in certain players, you know, like defensive players, if they're not focused. Uh, And in fact, if they, if they might even veer into the territory of having an attention disorder, uh, we can identify that and, um, you know, and provide uh, support for that. And there's a variety of different ways that that can be done. So that's sports. We have, uh, you know, one application area, which is, um, you know, you could kind of think of it as just a printing money uh, in some sense. So it's, it's in marketing. So the, you know, the data over the last 20 years is, is overwhelming. And we've collected a lot of this ourselves that using EEG data to um, optimize ads for um, to be engaging, to create positive emotions and to trigger memory and to trigger social connections. Uh, predicts market level activity. So we can figure out which ads are better. We can cut out the bad sections of ads. And one of the things that we're doing right now in a partnership with another company called Glassview, which is one of the countries, one of the world's largest digital media optimization companies is we can use that brain data on the fly to target ads to the most appropriate, uh, most receptive audiences Mm. using their very large database of like LinkedIn uh, profiles, et cetera. Mm-hmm. And, and right now that, you know, where campaigns have hoped to achieve a 20% uh, ROI, we're getting like two X to four X. So wow. it's, um, it's pretty awesome. crazy. Yeah. It's, it's great. Awesome. So, and we, we both got interest in the social neuroscience. Yeah. How are you capturing that reference data point? Um, through the yeah. brain. I'm just so curious to know but you're speaking yeah. to a lot of neuro nerds on this channel um so so, so there are so there are yeah go, go, to, go down the science for us all right so uh one of the uh, well we've been studying the social brain uh in the lab for I don't know too long to say 20 years um and it's something I've been interested in since I was a PhD student but so we look at the fundamentals where there is this circuit everybody has in our heads is social brain network and it manages our moment-to-moment interactions with other people, as well as our long-term relationships. People have more friends. This network is bigger. People have fewer friends. It's smaller, but it's responsive to the environment. So if you exercise, it actually gets bigger. It grows in its ability to do its job. One of the things that's really cool about it is that, um, and now this has been observed in animals, you know, from monkeys, mice, birds, bats, and humans, is that when we do things together, our brain synchronize and the better our relationship, the tighter that synchrony. So you can think of that, um, what we call brain synchrony or physiological synchrony as a biomarker, a biological marker of closeness. And it predicts all kinds of things like trust, teamwork, cooperation, learning, communication, and on and on and on. And since you've got a biomarker now that can tell you like, how good is our team chemistry? Does it need to be improved? And we're also, so we can say that, oh yes, you know, needs to be improved in this way. We can then use it as an indicator while we induce various kinds of interventions or exercises that bring people closer together. And so that's been a lot of fun, a lot of work that we've done, other labs have done over the last few years is to evaluate different kinds of team building um, interventions uh, to get people in sync really quickly so that they can uh, perform better, essentially. And, mm-hmm. you know, and we've shown and others have shown that um, in work conditions or work-like conditions, uh, whether you're on a 
committee, you know, and you've been on a shitty, sorry, <laughs> really bad committee <laughs> yeah, that, yeah. Uh, that uh, you know, it's dysfunctional. We know that's because you're not in sync and we've shown that you get people in sync and, and they can perform yeah, better yeah. or, I've got, I've or on the, or on the, you know, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Go like ahead. a techie, like a, like a nerdy question. Yeah. The, 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 in, in the social, uh, in, 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 so, in extroverts, people who are more social tend to have a slightly more pronounced amygdala. We've also seen that oxytocin is more prevalent during social engagements. We also know that mirror neuron theory hasn't worked out so well. So when you are looking at the at the EEG at the EEG data, what are you looking for? What are you what are you interested in spotting? Well, I mean, there it's quite literally that the um, especially activity in alpha waves is a pretty good uh, indicator yeah. that it becomes uh, more coherent between brains so you mm -hmm. can, uh, they come into greater alignment yeah, and there are a variety of different ways to measure that one thing that's been a challenge for uh, wearable eg or just in fact even doing this just in multiple individuals is having a really um, reliable way to actually synchronize the data that you're acquiring across devices. And so that's something that we put a lot of effort into having um, IR sensors essentially so that we can synchronize mm. the data. This but um, yeah, you know, I mean, you, I, I, you know, you, you've worked with HRV and heart rates. You see those synchronized too, but they are at slower time scales, right. and they correspond more to kind of emotional synchrony or synchrony and arousal. So all of these data together give you a really, really comprehensive picture of sort of shared mindset, shared emotions, and shared commitment to action. Um, which is uh, which is why it's a, you know this this concept I think is so uh, intriguing and so exciting. We we think it is I think it is the glue that keeps us together, and it is it reflects what you know the the, the father of, of sociology in the nineteenth century, Emil Durkheim, called collective effervescence. So this <laughs> sort of like the feeling like why do you go to a stadium to watch you know a football match? with all 100,000 people when you could sit at home and you know in comfort and watch it on TV because there's this feeling right there's this feeling there's, that's, a, buzz. That's, there's a buzz that supersedes what you would experience um on your own and mm. we we think that that really is what what synchrony is yeah this is so interesting the tech that you work that you're working on and the work that you're doing in the lab and in the field is really interesting to this community this is a community of practitioners and they're they're looking for you know tools and things that they can that they can use i mean can, can you use this technology as in a coaching practice can you use it in therapy is there an application for any of the other tools that you're speaking about in the from wharton i don't know there's an open question around how can what are the tools that we can throw over the fence yeah, uh, absolutely. In fact, um, this idea of synchrony was first, well, aside from, you know, Emil Durkheim aside, but the idea of it being used in applied sense was first uh, put forward, I think, by Carl Marcy. So, you know, he was with Nielsen. He he was head of their uh, neuroscience unit, but he is a practicing psychiatrist, and he talked about it being useful for therapy. And um, absolutely, we know that, uh, well, uh, one of the biggest predictors of the the effectiveness of um, of therapy is the relationship between the therapist and the patient. So this would provide an objective metric of that uh, relationship. Um, synchrony predicts the quality of a marriage and whether it's going to succeed or fail. Mm. So it, it's pretty wild. Our tech, I mean, I think along with other, you know, there's potentially other signals that can be relevant, uh, can be used in business settings. So in a, in a study we completed a pilot study we just completed with a company slalom which is a global management consulting company and there's a paper we wrote on it we published last month or so on the knowledge at wharton website but what we did is we measured brain activity in slalomers who were working uh and they were uh they were actually all remote which was cool uh, and this is an interesting company because they you know they scale up at about five or 10 X over the last few years. And most of those people are brought on board remotely, right? And they work remotely. 
And what we had them do was to watch a series of brief video clips that had been evaluated for synchrony in the past. And then a video clip that was um, a slalom promotional video. So why is it great to work at slalom? And what was cool is we, uh, we looked at brain activity while people are especially watching that slalom promo video. And uh, what we found is that, um, that individuals, that workers who, who reported having stronger or closer work relationships, that their brains were more in sync while they were watching that video. Okay. Now, these people in general had never met each other in the real life. And so what we had demonstrated here was that uh, this principle of biological synchrony evolved to subserve social relationships in real life, in the real world, actually is able to kind of operate at a distance. You know, I mean, it doesn't mean anything spooky or magical. It just means that as you start to work with somebody or you find people that you like, even even online, two of us are having a good conversation. You're on here. the same page, literally. You're on the same page. You click with each other. And you process in particular, this is what I thought was interesting, the, uh, you know, this advertisement for working at the company. So that message did not resonate with, it did not sink into people who had, you know, just didn't feel as connected to the company at all. And um, yeah, and then we observed this synchrony and this synchrony measure also um, predicted the strength of these work relationships. So, I, you know, that's just one, you know, one kind of, application. Now, one of the things that we're doing is trying to build on that um, in the work with that company by looking at, uh, by using synchrony as a metric of how well we connect with another agent. And so I say agent here because we've moved from what our brains evolved to do, which is to work with people in the real world, to working with people online. And now we're starting to work with autonomous agents or people who are um, have a co-pilot, right? And they could be embodied in a, an actual physical form or they might be chatbots or they might be avatars. And so there's a lot of really interesting, tricky questions there about how to do that right so that people develop trust in these relationships, exactly. right? I mean, if you're a fighter pilot uh, and you're leading a squadron of drones that you know, that, and you have to somehow trust them, right? Uh, that's, I think, super challenging. And uh, I don't know if you're, if you are, you're, you probably are. I mean, you and your, your viewers are pretty savvy, but, you know, there's this um, phenomenon called the uncanny valley, which was first described exactly. in the 1980s. Right. And it's like real humans. Yeah, you feel good about interacting with them. And right. things that are really far away, car right. cartoons, of, you know, teacups and things like that, like Disney and Pixar has made gazillions of dollars on mm. that. You feel connected to but there's something in between that's horrible and you feel disgusted and it's not quite human, but not quite a cartoon like Polar yeah. Express. Tom Hanks, our, our most beloved treasure as an actor in Polar Express, you just feel re re revolted by him. And it's because mm -hmm. he's close to human, but not quite human. So how do we uh, get this that, right? That, that circus yeah. clown, that shot dummy. It's yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Zombie. So how are we getting this right? It's so interesting. We've got to have this conversation in a canny valley in the end. You know, this is going to exactly. be so much fun. About you know, pretty much the whole community is remote, and we we connecting with people, and you know, we have these round tables and these discussions, and some click and some don't. But I've, I've got an interesting idea. One of the professors from Chicago has a neuro improv group, and. It would be like, I don't know, kind of fun to see how everybody syncs up during the improv, during this data. Wouldn't that be fun, huh? Uh, it would be great. I mean, one of the things, so so improv is a great call out here because uh, that field, in essence, had to figure out how to get people into alignment really quickly. Exactly. And if you look at now, this is our go-to uh, repository of exercises that get people in sync. So... Uh, the, the first warm-up game in every improv show is the mirror game. So you you actually move together. When you move together, it actually synchronizes your physiology. And so that's been mm. demonstrated, and it predicts the more in sync you get by moving together, the, the higher the trust, the better the cooperation, et cetera, et cetera, all that good stuff. So, yeah, I mean, I think that would be really uh, mm. fantastic.
to measure during real improv. No, we wish we could have so much fun together. I can see you. Yeah. Thank you so much, Mark. I'm going to let you go because otherwise I'll never let you go. But we'll definitely <laughs> have these conversations. Maybe we'll have um, you in the uh, neuro improv session. Maybe we'll have a, you know, just a downloading of all this cool tech with, with the community at large and just get to understand you. But looking forward to having you in the conversations in the hub and looking forward to our next conversation. It's really nice to have you on the call. Michael, have I list, missed anything or is that a good place to go? No, I think it's great. Um, hopefully we'll leave people wanting more. They can go to the websites. Exactly. Uh, Google me um, and you can find links to all yeah, this We'll stuff. drop all the links in the in the, yeah. in the recording. But thank you so much for the time. We're looking forward to speaking soon. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thanks this was a lot of fun.